Well, hello, I'm Dr. Julia Royston. Super excited to always bring you people, places, things, information, resources, and tools, and especially books. And so I have a young lady here with me today, and I want her to introduce herself, tell us where she's from, a little bit about what she does, and uh, where you can find her on social media, and if she has a website. You know, my people, I know you all are Googling and finding them on social media, send them friend requests, uh, even as we speak. So, um, Dr. Gray, go ahead and introduce yourself formally. Hi, my name is Dr. Tasha Thompson Gray. Dr. Tasha is fine when I'm not at work. <laughs> you know, hearing that whole name, I don't have to. <laughs> I, um, I am a mother of two adult children. And I am an educator. This is my 27th year in education. Currently, I didn't make it that far. I only made it 22. I only made it. Um, <laughs> I'm praying about 28. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This, uh, this pandemic has really rocked the boat. <laughs> Oh, yes, oh, this is the to itself. But. Oh, it sure is because this is the <laughs> first time I've ever felt like that in my life, in my ed career. Because I love what I do. I love working with children, and so um, currently I am a middle school um, assistant principal at a school just outside of Chicago in the West suburbs. And so that sixth through eighth grade group is uh, where I am right now. I have worked. Um, anywhere from kindergarten through eighth grade in those different, um, you know, those different capacities, leadership roles, as well as in the classroom. Um, I am on social media and I, um, you can, each one of my social media handles is some form of my name. Um, just looking at Tasha Thompson Gray, um, you can find my author's page, my regular page. I use both um, Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook. I'm on all of those social media channels. I do have a website and it is www.tashathompsongray.com with an A. So I always try to stick to my name because that's real simple to remember. Yeah. And that's a good hint for everybody for branding, yeah. you know, yes, uh, I was on a, a program sidebar. I was on a, a program not too long ago and they were like, one thing about it, we don't have to really do so much for Julia Royston, because you just Google her name, you can find everything. Right. She's yep. everywhere you want to be. And I'm like, yes, I want that. But it doesn't, uh, for people who have, not your name, but I mean, for some people who have John Smith, ooh, that's difficult. That, that That's really tough. But it really right. helps if you um, stick with branding. Okay, so let's yes. go back and yes. take a step back, even before we get to the book. <laughs> okay. Because as an educator to an educator, so um, how did you get to education? Um, it's real simple for me. I've never wanted to do anything else in my life. As a kid, I played school. I was, I love school. I was a big reader, had an extensive library, thanks to my grandmother and all the book clubs. And so education has always just been such a big part of who I am that um, I never wanted to do anything else. And that's why it's so hard, probably why I stayed so long, because I still can't imagine doing anything else. Mm, well, I'm the total opposite. My dad was an <laughs> educator. He thought education was king. And we said, no way are we doing that. Um, okay. Sounds so like my kids. I, uh, well, I kind of got boxed into it. Um, I was coming back home, having, having lived away for a long time. And then um, I couldn't get a, a library job anywhere, but at an all girls Catholic high school. And I'm like, are y'all for real? I don't have no kids. I don't want, I mean, I don't want nothing to happen to one, but I don't know, this, you uh, yeah. know, coming from a Fortune 500 corporate job to high school, that was a, a you know, yeah. a decrease, a, a deflation of my ego. I will be quite honest. I'm like, but these look, well, they were real tall. I mean, you know, the yeah. volleyball players and everything, they were huge compared to me. And I'm like, this is just really, stay 10 years. And then I got remarried okay. in 2006. And then I had the nerve to go to public school. Lord, oh. Jesus, Lord God. <laughs> I've only been school. in public school. You've so. always been in public school, child. Yes. Okay. I went to public school with elementary. Now you can remember, I just said I don't have no kids. I still don't. Right. Still don't have no children. Not okay. as, as my grandmother said. Now 
not chick no child <laughs> okay not chick okay. no child and here i am with these little people wrapped around my waist i'm like well are you kidding me and line up and get what yes so but it was a um uh, i think it was a training ground it was a humbling experience mm -hmm. and um I, I learned a lot. They taught me a lot. I mean, I, I'll be quite honest with you. So my dad, uh, we, my sister and I, we say he cursed us. <laughs> because he said, y'all should get at least a minor in education. We'd be like, no way. We're not doing that. That's beneath yeah. us. No. Uh, but it is a, um, uh, a rewarding personally, but it's not. Uh, very, very revered in this culture. So in this culture, uh, teachers are not revered. And I think I, until I got to a title one, you know, going from uh, all Catholic high school where the people pay 15 to $20,000 a year mm -hmm. for their child to go there. A lot of them were on scholarship, but a lot of them was, they was right. They was right shit. Shit. So you go from that to, um, public school title one 95 percent free reduced you go from that potential high uh economic socioeconomic group to poverty yes and when you got 95 percent free reduced that's everybody's broke that means everybody on paper how they doing what they doing i ain't getting into that but um everybody's uh, that that levels the playing field poverty is the playing field yes. and when you're all there and you know and you're in a school where everybody gets free breakfast and everybody gets free lunch and everybody and then the dinner one. programs yes <laughs> and the yeah and the blessings in a backpack and the mm -hmm. uh, nobody pays mm -hmm. for field trips and if we can't go on a free one or we don't have the money for it we just don't go because right. you can't have two people pay and the other 24 not pay right so right. what has been the greatest um satisfaction for you as an educator? Honestly, I'm a piggyback on the, what you were sharing about your experience. Um, I've only been in public schools and I started off because I went to Alabama State University. Okay. So I was, I started off teaching there. I wasn't sure, you know, um, if I was ready to come back home where I wanted to go. So I got certified there, got married, stayed total of 13 years all, in all. Um, but I started my education career in a high poverty, I'm sorry, a, a very wealthy school. And um, the dynamics, the racial makeup was very different from where I am now and where I've been throughout my career. I was one of two black teachers um, in that school. And so I know my principal, my very first principal there, she always told me, um, her story about why she went to the other side of the tracks to teach, so to say, because she grew up as a doctor's child. So she grew oh, up okay. with a silver spoon in her mouth. And she said, it's just so much more rewarding when you teach people who need you. And as much as I enjoyed and learned so much and built a lot of connections and relationships that I still carry on with my students, their families, and my coworkers from my first school, um, I, I realized after I left there, I went to Chicago Public Schools, Ooh, yeah. uh, which was a big difference because I was at, I, but it was an honor I, actually because I was able to teach in the school that I graduated from as oh, a child. Okay. Uh, yeah, I went there kindergarten through eighth grade. Everybody in the neighborhood knew my family. Everybody at the school knew my family. They had taught generations of us. So that was very humbling and very rewarding, but it also helped me to see that that was my niche. Mm -hmm. You know, that that was where I was needed. That's where I wanted to be. So every school since then, um, that was what, year nine, and I'm at 27. Ever since then, I've only been at high poverty uh, Title I schools. Yeah. Well, I, I, I say this on after three years of retirement, it was extremely rewarding, you know, because when you are with people um, extremely humbling too, but um, very rewarding, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did have, I think at one time there was like five or six of us in the building, but not many of us. And where I was right. in um, 
the city in, in Louisville is the very southwest end. You're looking mm -hmm. at the exit that says uh, Fort Knox this way. So okay. you're at the, the southwest tip and, um, you know, racism is, is huge out there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, yeah, it was, it was a major deal, but you realize that that poverty mentality crosses racial lines. It crosses all types of barriers. And Absolutely. so just as much as I had, whether I had the, the white child in the trailer or the, um, the black child in the projects or the white child in the fourplex, um, you know, it just didn't matter. Or the white child that was in the house or the black child that was in a house. I mean, you know, it just didn't matter. I was mm -hmm. having to work on their head to make right. sure that they knew that they could be more than what they'd seen. They could go higher and go further and faster. And I even had a, a, a one of the teachers say, you know, you're you're you don't even come from where they come from. They, you're black. I was like, well, you're just assuming that, but you're right. I you're right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I may not be there this. now. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know anything about that level of poverty, but they need to be able to see somebody who looks like them. Who, um, who hasn't been there, who can um, use correct English and who, you know, is not sitting around rolling a neck and popping up finger and, you know, right. and can use proper right. English. You know, you need to be able to see that. You need to be able to know that, that those type of people actually exist. I mean, you know, I had, I had children in that school that not only had the father in jail, the mama might have been in jail. I had a little boy yes. said, oh gosh, you remind me so much of my mama. I said, oh, that is so great. Go ahead and get in line. And the next right. probably two, three weeks, because I was the itinerant teacher. So I was mm -hmm. a librarian the first two years. And then uh, year three through 12, I was the technology teacher. So I taught okay. everybody in the building. Okay. And so then he comes back and says, I want to show you a picture of my mama. And I'm like, sure, let me see it. And baby, when I saw that khaki, I was like the khaki outfit. And I knew mm -hmm. that was from the women's correctional mm -hmm, state, mm -hmm, women's correctional mm -hmm. facility. I was, you know, it was like somebody, oh, then I had to right. fix my face and mm -hmm. keep looking at the picture and get myself stilled. And oh my God, I guess I do look like your mother. Oh my <laughs> God, this is a wonderful picture. Be sure right. to put that in your backpack and don't, you know, just. Yes. I, was like, I know. It, 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 it. Um, woo! I, my friends always say they don't know how I do it. And I just say, you know, I just thank God for giving me the patience, yeah. the endurance, the love. Um, it's just, this is just such a big part of who I am. Yeah. Being an educator at I church. I didn't know I was. It was a call for me. It was mm -hmm. a call. I mean, you know, I know people, oh, this is all I want to do. I play teacher. I, <laughs> no, we did not play teacher. <laughs> we did not do any of that. And I, and I applaud you. And I'm just like, that's great. But this was a call. This was kicking and screaming. This is crying, going home every day. I can't do it. I can't do it. Right. And then when the check came and it was much higher from private school to public school, I'm like, okay, I'll go back. I guess so. I was like, <laughs> but it was, it was horrific. I mean, it was traumatizing from, mm -hmm. you know, finding the child with a arm broke. Why is your arm broke? And then finding the child that, it's like, oh my gosh, this person, we're moving. Okay, good. Uh, we're moving into a double wide trailer. And I've always lived in the house. I've mm -hmm. never lived in the projects. I've always lived in the house. And so right. I had to stop. And the teacher was like, get your face, get your face. Right. Okay, so we're excited about that. Yes. I get my own yes. I said, like, that is so great. Oh, I, so I went big like she would be. But I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, you don't, you know. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. know, that can get me off into somewhere. Even three years retired, I can still see that little girl excited because she can put posters on her wall in her double wide mm -hmm. trailer. And I was like, yay, great. But right. I was still so like, oh Lord, okay. Oh, <laughs> but I had to learn, you know, it was a it was a right. growing up experience. I was in the library at the early on and, and I'm looking going, Jesus, you got jokes, right? This is this is a test. Like, I'm not really gonna have to stay here, right? This is just a oh, one year to see if I would do it and all that. And he said, and mm -mm. you can leave these children right here. He said, This is a nation. Right. You best believe I got my he checked me that he checked me 
Yes. And I said, yes, sir. I'm sorry. In, in my khaki today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I said, yes, sir. And I kept on going. I, I still cried every day going home, but <laughs> But it's, it's not easy. I get it. And I, I have a lot of people. I know a lot of people who um, came about education in that way. I have a friend that worked in corrections. And when she, um, you know, when she moved here, um, she got married to someone that was from here and she moved here and she couldn't find a job in corrections. So she thought, oh, my child's going to school. I'll go be a sub. <laughs> and so <laughs> she started <laughs> subbing. And then, you know, she was like the most popular sub in the district. She was doing the long-term subbing. Then it became a teacher's aide. And then she ended up going back and now she is a school counselor. Mm. So, you know, is some people come about it in different ways. And, you know, some people like, I think that this is just who I am. I can't imagine not being in education. And I'm like, mm. okay, three degrees later and they're all in education. I'm still boxed into education. You know, well, you so I, nowhere, sorry. <laughs> when can you I retire? think I want to go to the year 29. Year 30, uh, can you go at 30? Well, yeah, yeah, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, I just I never see myself retiring this year. I started to think about it, and then I thought about well, Tasha, you know, when you decided you wanted to go back and get that doctorate, you said you were gonna do 25 years in the classroom and then you were gonna move to the college level. And I just wasn't ready at year 25. I still felt that yearning and I just kind of ignored what I had set out to do and said, I'm just going to stick it out until I start feeling a certain oh, yeah. way. It'll tell you, it'll tell oh, you. Oh yeah. Now, for me. Um, I'm starting to feel that way. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, you're, everybody's got to do it the same and everybody can't, you know, I knew I did not have, uh, 27 years on me. I did, yeah. um, you know, 12 years basically in the system, but they gave me money wise 10 years credit. So I had okay. 22 years money, but you don't make any from your 20 right. on the money doesn't right. go like up and down. No. And, no, it doesn't do all that. It just stays the same. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. money wise, I can't really make, I've tapped out, but my business took off. So okay. therefore my, my clients. So in um, June, 2017, uh, my principal came by, how you doing, Ms. Rustin? I said, I need to see you. Come on, come on in and close the door. <laughs> he was like, oh, Lord. I said, well, I just want to let you know, next year is my last year. I turned 55. I'm now 58, so I turned 55. So um, that's it. Because that was my prayer. Don't let somebody lie on me or push me out. Let me tell mm -hmm. them. That was mm -hmm. my prayer. Let me tell yes. them when I'm leaving. And then, yes. so I had the joy and the pleasure of when we came back to school the next school year because as a technology teacher you know we stand up every department has to kind of say okay what's going to happen this year and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. so when I stood up I said and the last thing is this is my last school year I could have run around that library because <laughs> it was I such bet. a relief for me to mm -hmm. know that I had somewhere else to go but it was uh, one another teacher said you funded your dream here yes he said yes. this was the one that mold you and make you but I didn't want anything to happen I mean you know I've had to call CPS on on children with uh, abuses I've, I've seen uh abuses of children on children in my room I've had you know just all kinds of horrific things I've had the gym teacher come with a uh uh um a little girl who jump rope I'll never get that day the, she came with the Miss Royce and my ponytail came off and the, yeah. the teacher was white with cropped hair. Like, I don't know what to do with this thing. <laughs> right. She's like, fix right. this. And I was like, well, I don't have no kids. Well, fix it. Her teacher can't do it. She said she had boys. And she, I was like, come on, let's dry. They'll eyes. figure it out. <laughs> Here's your sanitizer. And I'm like, okay, I'm wearing ponytails. Let's see if we can cut this. And then I got two bobby pins every time. Okay, now jump up and down, baby. Okay, yay, it's it. <laughs> Girl, I mean, just all kinds of things tell you. All I know. Kinds of them little things. And I, I, last thing, the um, NEA um, president, I can't even remember which one it was. But anyway, she went down through all the things that the teacher is, the nurse, the counselor, that an educator is. And I was just screaming and yelling at that video like, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So it is. And, um, so pray for a teacher. Pray for those in education. It's not no. It's not for the faint of heart. No, no, no. And especially this year, because I have yeah. said 
when I first got my doctorate's degree, you know, people were like, oh my God, you're a doctor. I'm like, not a medical doctor, not that kind of doctor. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I said this year, now I feel like I work for the CDC. Yeah. And so like we've added some even more like contact tracer and, you know, you've got all this stuff to figure out. And so right now I'm just decide trying to decide and trying to, I guess, um, distinguish if what I'm feeling is directly related to the pandemic that has added this extra stress and extra pressure and or all these extra really duties the job? or, or is got, it really just time? That. It's not, it yeah. can't be just. You know, it has to get down to, I cannot do this. This, If we all got vaccinated and everything was a perfect world and it was back to that, would I still feel that way? That's what we have to get to. Right. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, That's what I'm trying to figure out. And it's really hard because it's like, I don't see things changing um, Uh, 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 anytime soon. I pray for so, y'all every day. I do. I pray yes, for please. And we I need lift it. my hands in my office. Like, thank you, God. I don't have to do. But it is a it is a real place for people listening. It is a real um, issue um, for educators because it's yes. now no longer just the child, just the curriculum, just no. the getting in the building, just feeding them and getting them home safe on the bus. It's way more than that it's the risk factor it's the risk of all of us not just yes. the kids in the room so yeah it's it's a whole lot so yeah as i said there's I'll a lot going on for you because it's, it's just <laughs> um it's more than a notion to this day so we're going to take a break right here and we'll be right okay. back and we're back so excited see i knew when I get to talking with educators, it just goes into a whole nother thing. We're supposed to be just talking about our book and roll on out. But as you can tell, the conversation continues to go. As you know, Julia Royston, if I'm interviewing you, it's going to be very conversational and something that I'm interested in. And I hope other people are interested in it. And I want you to really think about education. And I know some of you are like, I got grandkids, girl, I ain't got to worry about it. Yes, you do. Any child, any under 18 human being on the planet, we all are in this literally together. Now, I know we heard yes. that all of COVID. We like, I'm so sick of that cliche, but it is the truth. Because mm-hmm. as the next generation, remember, those are the people that are going to be taking care of you in the nursing home, that's going to be in the service industries that, hello. So we have to make sure that they're ready, prepared, qualified, and for the next generation. So whatever you can do to help that, even if it's just to encourage them little children that running around in your yard and get on your nerves and turn over your trash can, if you can do anything to help lead and direct them in the right direction. Educators, we thank you. And we uh, we appreciate that. So shifting gears, you know, to my favorite part of any interview that I am involved in and talking about um, books, yes. So those of you who don't know, books have just pretty much been my life, all of my life, even before I could read. My mother read to us every night. We went to the public library almost every other week. Um, my sisters, we just were just, I'm the most ferocious reader, ravenous reader, because I'm the chick that they got mad at and told to turn the light out because Jay is under the covers reading that book again and she ain't turned the light out yet. And, you know, I would always get into turn that light out and go to, the, you know, so. That was that was the probably one of the biggest things. There were some others, but you know that was the biggest uh, yelling my parents did. So, tell us about your book, and first off, tell us where what it's about, but also um, give us a little backstory of why you wrote it, and then where people can buy it. Okay, okay. So this is actually my second book. Um, I found myself, um, you know, like I said, my road to being an educator was, you know, so straight and narrow. Um, There were no other curves to it, but becoming an author was not something that I saw in my future, not something that I strive to to become. I had a conversation with um, someone that was telling me um, they had published their book and was encouraging me to turn my dissertation into a book. And I thought, hmm, so I thought that was the route I would go if I were going to publish anything outside of my dissertation. 
And um, I found myself um, writing during the pandemic. And that's where I wrote my first book um, about the ABCs of COVID-19. And then I thought, oh, I'll be done with this. This one hit wonder. I figured it out. I did it. Great. Yay. Um, no. <laughs> so every year um, when it's Black History Month, I always found so much joy in teaching my students. Um, even when I was you know, at a predominantly white school, I enjoy teaching about the African-American inventors. I've just always been intrigued at how uh, innovative they were. And I found myself over the years, I mean, I um, read something and turned it to a play. So we did a little skit for the Black History program. I was always trying to insert, you know, African-American inventors. And so um, I found myself over the years just continuing to find more and more inventors. And um, I started, you know, even with the slightest thing, I would find myself saying, hmm, my people are innovative. And I, I would always say that even when I would see someone figuring like, you know, you see someone without something and they just figure out how they can do what they need to do without in the absence of something that they need. And so, you know, going down the street, riding down the street, I would see people doing things and I'd always say, I tell you, my people are innovative. So I think this book has really been a part of me. I just had never seen it as a book. And so um, I decided that, you know, um, after my first book and people kept saying, you need to write something else. And a colleague of mine said, I could really see you doing this. That book was well-written. I think you should really tap into that. And so I thought, huh, okay. And so I just kind of turned my knowledge of African-American inventors into a story. Um, it's the story of um, a brother and sister during Black History Month talking about their projects and about inventions and kind of one trying to one up each other and their mom happens to hear them and then she starts telling them about different things that um, were invented by uh, Black inventors. And it just, the story just kind of goes on. Dad comes home and then he starts sharing his knowledge and they're pointing out things in the house. And so um, it's, you know, I'm always looking for hidden messages. You know, we always hear that by the time a child comes to school, they've been at home for five years with their parents. So they really are their first teachers. And so I play on that because we don't, um, it's not in the curriculum to learn about all of the innovative things that African-Americans have invented. And so I do play into that. Um, they learn these things in their home, not at school. And so um, just sharing that knowledge, I found the story very easy to write because I was very motivated to just get it out there. And um, this summer I was actually doing an event and I was, uh, someone came to my table and she said, oh, this looks interesting. And the, the uh, event was honoring her uncle. And oh, so wow. she came around to the, in, to the table and she said, this looks very interesting. She's like, my uncle is an inventor. And I was like, oh, really? What did he invent? And she said, the pencil sharpener. And I was just floored because I opened up the book oh, and no. turned to the page that I was that I showed who invented the pencil sharpener. Oh. And she's like, oh my goodness, I have to get this book. I have to stay connected to you. And so that was just like, wow. She's like, thank you so much for including him mm -hmm. in your book. And so it's just so many things and, you know, doing a little research, like I knew some of the products, but I couldn't remember the names of the inventors. So in doing my research, you know, reading the backstory was interesting. Um, you know, reading about why we have the electric elevator doors, um, because when they had the shaft doors, um, you know, the inventor was on the elevator shaft with his daughter. And what happened is, um, and his name is Alexander Miles, I just realized I didn't mention his name, but he was on the elevator with his daughter and, you know, you had to close the doors manually. Yes. And so um, they forgot to close the door and his daughter almost fell through the elevator shaft oh, wow. because the door was not closed. And so he turned that, that experience into something like, I'm going to fix this and not have someone else to go through such a frightening experience. Mm -hmm. And he invented the, the automatic elevator doors. And so even with Garrett Morgan, most people hear his name. He's a common name for the traffic light. 
but he was on his way home and saw a traffic accident and they that's when they didn't have lights and so he took that experience because when he saw the accident he wanted to do something about it how can we be safe how can we not keep having this even though we still have it sure um sure. you know but could you imagine if we didn't have this oh, Lord, the traffic light no, <laughs> no. everybody deciding country. when they're gonna go like they do now <laughs> Yeah, they do it anyway. They do it now. Like, I'm ready to go. I'm I know. Take off. When you go to countries that they don't have traffic lights, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, how is this going to work? But they're actually more polite to the pedestrians yeah, than we are, exactly. you know, here. So, you know, turning, you know, that knowledge and, you know, just turning that into a book was very rewarding to me because I think right now we're at a very pivotal time in society mm -hmm. that I think in my lifetime, it's the only time that I felt like we actually have a chance to turn some things around. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, wow, this is a great time to write and tell our story and get these names out here. So people understand that we're much more than who they see on mm -hmm. the evening news, who they right. read about in the newspapers. And, you know, people always talk about our culture and there are so many people that love so many things about our culture. Yeah. And I think what ends up happening to what I, what my experience has been is the entertainment industry, that's great. You can sing, you can dance, you can right. dribble a basketball, you can, you know, throw a football. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about the doctors and the scientists and the astronauts, that's a whole different realm oh, yeah. that yeah. we don't pay enough attention to. Mm -hmm. So that was very important to me. Um, a couple years ago, I guess it was in 2020, February 2020, the last time, you know, we we were on site was a little bit after that, but um, for Black History Month, my office door, I decorated it and it said something to the effect of uh, slaves, it said slaves were not brought to America, astronauts, scientists, doctors, lawyers were kidnapped and told that they were slaves. Wow, I love that. And so that that's the part that, you know, I'm passionate about. And I try to instill that in my young people, which is why, you know, when I'm in school and I'm at work, I want to be that person that they see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, I am that person. I grew up, you know, on the south side of Chicago. If you watch Chicago news, you hear about my former neighborhood all the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I came from. But that's not who I am that didn't grow up inside of me. And so here I am now an educator here. I am. I'm not, you know, saying like, Oh, I'm better than that. But, you know, to have those humble beginnings, I try to tell young people that where you begin is not where you end. Exactly. You don't choose where you're born. You don't choose your family, but you know, as you get older, when you get to make those choices, make choices that you can have a brighter future. And so here I am, the product of CPS, one of the worst neighborhoods in Chicago with a doctorate's degree. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. You know, whoever, you know, I didn't see that in my future, but I think a lot of times, you know, I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to be a teacher. And then it's like, someone said to me, no, you need to get in administration. And I was like, oh no, I don't want to go to the dark side. I want to stay with the babies. I'm like, oh, you, you'll have a bit bigger uh, that's impact. That's what I did say. I was like, I don't like when y'all behave. Y'all get this. No. Uh, I do have a doctorate, but I'm like, no, I'll, I'll stay boots on the ground. That's what I said. Right. No, 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 I'll stay boots on the ground. Y'all can do that. Seem to forget what happens over here. So right. That if I you know, I have those right experiences. Here, let me, you know, y'all forget everything and act like yeah. you forgot, you know, that the baby yeah. what the babies exist and you get running no. with your friends and all that. Like, did y'all forget yeah. what we doing in that? Well, you know what I call it? And I was just talking to um, someone who's just getting started, a second year teacher. And she is just, I said, this is a tough time to get in the field because everybody is. is catching it with this pandemic. I said, you know, but the thing she's experiencing is something that I, you know, I thrive on not being as that administrator who abuses their authority. Yes. Um, you know, I'm right here in the trenches with you. I'm in the lunchroom. I'm talking to the students and I'm, you know, getting to know their names, getting to know their families and their personalities and things just as much as the teachers are. I'm not that person that is so far removed from the classroom that, you know, I forget, you know, I try to be realistic 
And if I need a reminder, I just go plop down in the classroom. That's right, you know, and, yeah. Yes. Go through and, the lunchroom and see that food being thrown in the garbage and <laughs> this one hungry and the little dirty shirt. And, and I think yeah. you saw that same ketchup stain on Monday and it's Friday right. and that same ketchup stain is on that shirt. Like, who is his mama? Who is his dad? Right, right, right. I was good. And, I could tell it coming off the bus. I could look at it. I know it. I know it. They knew I, who is that and where are they from? And they pull mm-hmm. up the... The, I could stand there next to the secretary and she pull it up. She said, Julie, you good. I said, baby, yeah. after 10 years. Because you can I read it. Good. You can read it. You can read it's it. It's a you feeling. Can tell it. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. And that's why as an educator, my mantra is the children who are the hardest to love are the ones who need it the most. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And I learned that from my first uh, principal. Like I said, she was a godsend in my opinion. And she, um, she taught that to me because every year, the students with the the neck rollers like you were talking about and little girls with the attitudes that, you know, just were a little bit different than most of the students because in Alabama at that time, they didn't have a desegregation plan. Um, And this was a late, this was, I started teaching in 95, in 1995. So not too long ago, um, they didn't have a desegregation plan. So they had to um, bring children from the black neighborhood over to the community where I worked by bus. And my principal taught me so many things in that because, you know, I had the kid who lived with grandma and mom lived, you know, just across the border in another state. And that would promise I'm coming, I'm coming to see you this weekend and wouldn't come. And then this kid gets to school and is throwing a chair the next day. And, you know, some teachers were like, oh, my God, he's going to hurt somebody. Yes, this is true. But, you know, I started and now it's a big push with the resilience, um, figuring out, you know, what has happened to this child, Mm. not why is this child doing this or, Mm. you know, it's what has happened that has caused this child. And that has just that's always been my passion in trying to. you know, figure out why is this kid acting the way they do? Right. Yeah. Because they don't have the the vocabulary or the spunk mm-hmm. to just say, mm-hmm. I'm hurting because I didn't see my mom this week. Yeah. Weekend. She didn't so come and she out. might send money or put something in a card, but that's not the right. same. Oh, God. Right. I found that so, out at the private school where I taught this little girl. Oh, yeah. You didn't show. And he, hey, her dad has, he said, well, here, uh, go buy something. He gave her a hundred dollar bill. And she literally threw it at his face. Right, I'm because like, they, that's not what they want. Her. She said, but you didn't come. You were right. here. It's your presence. You did not. Ooh. Yes. I, that was a, I, I tell you what, them babies, they taught me a lot. Even my oh, yeah. first year, the little girl said, uh, Miss Rosen, we don't respect nice. We don't understand nice. We don't know anything about nice. We don't come from mm-hmm. nice. So if you're going to be out here with us, you're going to have to get tougher. You're going to have to mm-hmm. get meaner. You got to be stricter. We don't get into that uh, little nice thing. You trying to be real nice. We don't know nothing about that. They smell that. They smell that. She and they look at that as fear. Me. But that was the best advice I ever got. She goes, we don't know nice. We don't respect. She wobbled her head. We don't know mm-hmm. nice. We don't respect nice. And we don't understand nice. You and see that those talk. were the students that I that I would always have in my classroom. Yeah, um, well, you know, I had them because I had to teach everybody. So right, I was right. whether I wanted to have them or not. Here they come. Oh Lord, yeah. I called them. I had this one class, Hatfield's horrible. I said, Oh, here comes that. But then I realized I can't call them that out loud. I never did to their face, but I was like, Oh, here comes Hatfield's horrible. But I'm like, well, then you're pronouncing horrible over them mm-hmm. even though they're gonna act more. right you can't you can't you know so it was yeah like, see it was i'm that silver time. lining in the school that you know my my office made he would always say to me um because you know if they if the kids had a story they were going to be my best friend oh yeah 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 <laughs> they were going to be my school children and one day he said he said tasha why do you always align yourself with the most neediest kid in the building i said i don't they're fine. They find their way to me. It's like yeah. I'm a magnet. Oh, yeah. You know, the little girl that just needs a mother in her life, mm. the little boy that just needs to be told that he can do it. Yeah. Like those are my little babies. And it got to the point that the disciplinarians would bring those children to me because of my relationship with them. Yeah. 
And yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's um, all about, it's all about relationship. Absolutely. So where can people find, because we don't even have time to get into the critical yeah. race theory. Okay. I only have no. time because that's, that's just like. That's a whole nother show. A, a part of that is a host. And, and it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's a cover screen, up. you know, it's a covering for, you know, for, oh, I don't want to know, I don't want to give that other race any kind of attention because it looks like it, it lessens me in some way. And you can imagine that's just crazy the way that even sounds. Yeah, um, because nobody's trying to demean anybody. We're trying to add to your education exactly. rather than to retract. But you know, we're not going to get into that today. Yeah. We have to come back for another. <laughs> so, yes. where can people buy your book from your website? Yes, yes. So you can buy it at my website www.tashatompsongray.com. You can also find me on Amazon. Uh, my books are also carried online from uh, Target, Walmart. Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. So you can pick out whichever um, store works best for you. I know some people like to use their prime benefits and that's fine. Um, and that's the beauty in being self-published. Like you get to control all of that. And so my books are from me. And if you're local, like if you find me at vending events, I always keep my uh, vehicle stock with books, but you can buy them online. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, um, that's perfect. Because first off, first off, uh, as the publisher, as not your publisher, but as a publisher, always mm -hmm. buy your books from the author because one, they know who bought it, and two, you can get a signed copy. Those others, absolutely on demand. Uh, we don't know who bought them, and people no. are like, well, didn't you know I bought your book? No. If you buy it no. on Amazon, we don't know. If you buy it directly from us on her website, so go to. Uh, TashaThompsonGray.com and purchase her book because then she'll know you bought it and you can get a signed copy or anything else, bookmarks or anything else that yes. you're doing as well as keep up with what's happening next because I'm just quite right. sure that more things are on the horizon and yes. thank you so much and find her on all social media and everywhere and then um, as an assistant principal, she's more uh, available to speak at your uh, upcoming uh, conference. So be sure and be on the lookout for her. Reach out to her. Um, fortunately, that's one of the beauties of um, technology and even the COVID space is that she can speak directly from her office. Um, right. My office is a little messy. So as the publisher, you know, you just have to look for books everywhere, but that's that's just a part of the ambiance of my, yes, <laughs> of yes. my life. <laughs> yes. But yes. Um, yes. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I forgot to mention. So I wrote the book and I had decided I wanted to do a coloring book. Oh, so okay. there is a coloring slash activity book to go along with that um, for the younger readers. It's, you know, not the full storyline, but like a sentence or two about the uh, invention and the inventor. And then a few activities in that. So it's something for everyone. It is really is a family treasure. Um, some adults buy it and they're like, I just want to have this, you know, just something right. that's just highlighting. So you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you have a, a clue that the, as I say, the name brand just didn't take away everything that you know. Right. Uh, as I say, the actual name behind the name brand and where the actually invention and discovery uh, came from. So thank you so much and be sure educators, you buy a few copies, get a classroom set yes, so yes. that you can actually um, teach that uh, in February of Black History Month. So we appreciate that. Thank you so much for being my guest. And uh, remember um, to live your best life. I'm Dr. Julia Royston. Have a great day. Bye-bye.